So can everyone see my screen? I can see it. I, yeah. I think we're good. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Okay. So um, it's always challenging doing one of these talks because there's a very wide range of abilities and experiences across uh, you know, a large club. And also in a lot of astronomy clubs, there's lots of people who don't do any imaging at all. And it's almost seen as a, a dark art, which they prefer not to know about. Um, so from my photography background, uh, I, I was a classical black and white photographer as a hobby in the same style as, you know, Ansel Adams and, and people such as himself, uh, especially landscapes and uh, big, big prints in the, in the back of the garage. And so I thought I'd, I'd take you through um, a couple of topics. I've got a small agenda. So um, without any more ado, um, first of all, I'll just tell you a little bit about my background. And then this was the proposed agenda. So a discussion on gain and exposure uh, with these new cameras that are around. Some things on calibration. So there's some, there's some gotchas if you're experienced in CCD photography, coming to CMOS, there's a couple of things that can cause problems. Um, and that will conclude with a, a PixInsight look at the batch processing script. And then potentially a break at that point, because we'll have been going about an hour and a half uh, from the beginning of this meeting. And then go back into PixInsight and looking at some image processing ideas. And I can do more or less depending on what your interests are. Um, there's a, always a, an air of mystery around deconvolution. Um, also a couple other nice little ones like Mueller denoise, um, removing stars and doing different ways of doing masking and some different ideas on star substitution, which I, th I think I saw in some of the images that you showed a little earlier. So without any more ado, um, so about me. So my background is in electronics and software and I've been doing black and white photography for about 40 years and being an electronics engineer and um, necessity being the mother of invention I, I designed over um, a very boring Christmas uh, a, a darkroom meter that I realized that was quite unique um, I went up to see Ilford Limited and who said oh that's a good idea um, you should patent that <laughs> so it's uh, we're not interested ourselves, but it's really good. So, and 25 years later, I'm still selling them all around the world. So I started writing magazine articles, and then it sort of culminated in a book called Way Beyond Monochrome that's still available. Um, and I think it's probably one of the last books written on classical black and white photography before digital took over. Um, and then digital kind of killed the darkroom. Uh, the people, um, I was doing a lot of competition work, and unfortunately people were judging what you were doing in a darkroom with what you could do in Photoshop and devaluing all the craft. Um, so I, I kind of stopped doing photography for a while and turned to astrophotography in 2011. And then one of the reasons I write books is I, I like writing books, but also it's a fantastic way of learning. It's a very structured way of making sure you know what you're talking about and, and doing things right. And, and the... <laughs> The other benefit is all your all your telescopes and stuff become tax deductible, which is quite quite handy. Um, so that's quite legitimate. You know, I pay taxes on the income, and I I get tax relief on all the all the. Well, that's what I tell my wife anyway. Um, so I was an electronic engineer and a purchasing manager and a quality manager in Ford, and I retired a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic started, which was excellent timing. Um, and during lockdown, I've been I started writing another book. Um, unfortunately, the book that you see here, Capturing the Universe, a week before it was published, somebody on Cloudy Nights pointed to me to um, a free Acrobat download of the entire book. Um, and someone had pirated it, uh, probably from the ebook. And the sales of this one are a tenth of the sales of this one, which is rather unfortunate. Um, so uh, the next one won't be in ebook format because that makes pirating a lot less uh, easy. So moving swiftly on, um, we're going to talk about uh, cameras and gain and exposure. So uh, one of the things that I wanted, a lot of people asked me on some of the forums about what's the best gain setting for cameras. And in the old days uh, with CCDs, you'd have 
two gain settings, typically whether you either bin or don't bin. Um, and with CMOS cameras, you've got a whole range of, of, of gain settings from naught all the way in some, depending on the camera, up to a couple of thousand. Um, so I wrote a couple of notes and I can send you this uh, keynote presentation, uh, Kevin, if you want uh, afterwards. Um, but there's a couple of things that people get confused about. There's the gain setting and then there's, there's gain. The gain setting is what you do to the camera and the gain is basically telling you how many electrons does it take to change the output. Um, now, obviously, electrons are a, a, a finite, small amount of charge. And typically, we, we're, we're aware of things like the, the well depth, which is the number of electrons that a camera can read before it starts to max out. This is confused slightly because at high gains, before the actual pixel sight has uh, actually received enough electrons, the, the output's already at the, the, full, the full value. So it, it gets confusing. And uh, so what I was going to do is just run through a couple of things that hopefully will, for the people especially starting off, um, to try and understand about gain. So as I mentioned at the top, gain is amplifying the electronic charge but before digital sampling. It's not done after the sampling, it's done before. So you have an analog, an analog voltage, which if you look very carefully is not really analog, it's a series of little steps. And gain's not something new, it's been around for you know the beginning of time when digital cameras first came about. Um, but CMOS cameras make a big thing of it. Um, and one of the reasons they make a big thing of it is because you can advertise uh, parameters of a camera at two different gain settings and claim that it, it cures world hunger, when in actual fact, at the same gain setting, it, it doesn't. Um, so as I said before, CCDs had two gain settings, and CMOS typically has a range of 40 to 1 in terms of the actual physical amplification. Um, some are less and sometimes a bit more. And for those who are using a digital SLR or a mirrorless camera, the gain setting is equivalent to the ISO setting on the camera. Um, so the key thing on moving to the right hand side, the key things about gain is it doesn't change the amount of captured light. And the golden rule in astrophotography is capture more light. So I very um, worryingly came across uh, an article in um, uh, the Sky at Night, which is an English astronomy magazine, where one of their editors had said the best the best uh, settings for a DSLR is to set the gain uh, as high as possible, and you get the highest quality when you have the shortest exposures. And it's like, well, that's absolutely the wrong thing to say. It's quite the reverse. Um, the other thing that's happened fairly recently is for those of you who interface their cameras to a computer through ASCOM, on the Windows platform, the latest version of ASCOM now permits the, uh, the gain being changed on the fly. So when you capture a sequence of exposures, you can capture a sequence of different gains at the same time. Whereas before, you would have to go into the ASCOM driver and manually set the gain and, and the offset, and then come back and start your sequence again. So that's something that has changed fairly recently, maybe in the last four months. And some of the camera manufacturers are still catching up, getting their ASCOM drivers to work properly. And QHY, for instance, has only just sorted theirs out in the last month and a bit. Now, one of the things that happens when you increase gain is that the read noise reduces. And the reason it reduces is because in terms of the CMOS camera, the, the, the read noise that's measured and reported is actually a combination of the sensor noise in terms of the pixel sites, but also during the conversion process, it gets quantized by the analog to digital converter. And that introduces an extra bit of noise on top of the read noise. And the higher the gain, the less that has an effect. So in effect, the, the true read noise of a sensor is what you typically see at very, very high gain. And everything at the low gain where it increases is the influence of quantization noise. The other thing that happens conversely with high gain, um, it's not all good news, 
every silver lining has a cloud, um, is that the dynamic range reduces with increased gain. Um, and by dynamic range, I'm talking about the, the number of electrons that you can measure versus the, the read noise as a ratio. Um, but there are some very clever cameras around that make the dynamic range reduction quite small, and it's not as, not as bad as you might think. And one of the key lessons here is that image calibration files must use the same gain setting and offset as the pictures that you take through your telescope. If you try to shortcut that, you will typically end in, in tears. Um, and uh, the last point is there, there is no best setting for all situations. There are a couple of cameras where there's probably a, a, a good overall setting, but individual circumstances, depending on whether it's a very um, bright uh, star cluster with an extreme range of, of, of brightnesses between the stars in the background, or a very dim nebula that doesn't have a huge range of, of values, you can change the gain and get a better situation. Um, there are a couple of sensors which have a definite knee in their their read noise and dynamic range uh, characteristics with gain, and they actually change the, their internal behavior around the point where the knee is. And sometimes the, the best setting there is just after the knee. Um, so again, there's a range of CMOS cameras. Not everyone is the same, and, and it's a case of understanding your particular camera. Um, so on to the next slide. So I thought there's a lot of discussion about using short exposures and, and what's the best exposure length. Um, and so the little things are to be careful of is when you see a, a picture on Astrobin or whatever, and it says 18 hours exposure, they're talking about the physical exposure time that, that uh, those cameras were, you know, had their shutters open. It isn't necessarily the imaging time overall. And that's a subtlety that can catch you out. So with short exposures, you've got less dark noise because it, dark noise comes from dark current. Um, and the, the less dark current you have, the less noise. So that, that's, oops, sorry about that. Um, and the conversely, more dark noise on the other side. With short exposures in any 10 hour period, you have um, more physical exposures. Um, it's less likely to clip bright stars, um, but you get more read noise events. So every time you make an exposure, you've got an additional lot of read noise in with your exposure. And the other thing is that you get more lost time from overhead. So that the overheads are the time to dither and settle, uh, the time to download the image to your computer. Sometimes the computer also uh, computes the uh, the star sizes uh, and things like that, so that it it takes a number of seconds to actually get to the point of starting the next exposure. Um, the other thing with short exposures is bad events like um, uh, someone turning on a, a search light or you know insecurity lights as we like to call them in the UK. Um, that has less impact, clearly, if you have short exposures, because it only ruins, you know, a two, one minute exposure rather than 15 minutes. And to some extent, depending on the mount, it's easier on tracking and if you're working unguided. Um, for me, unguided operation, I can do it, but it's it's a bit of a crusade. Um, and I prefer just to guide and, and just get over it. Um, and the other thing is that over any period of time, you actually capture less photons with short exposures. So um, the key takeouts are is that in the case of short exposures, you have read noise is more significant. Um, and in the case of long exposures, that read noise is less significant. And this is one of the things that leads to the concept of sky limited exposures, where you're, you're trying to tune your exposure so that the background level, the noise from the background level, which is the shot noise of the of the sky, um, the ratio of that to your read noise um, is at a ratio of about 5%. So if I move on to the next slide, um, 
This is the concept of sky limited exposure, which is built into some applications. But this is this is one bookend. This is the short exposure bookend. This is the minimum exposure in order to get a ratio of the the background electron um, divided by the read noise. So in other words, um, when you have a, a background in terms of electronics, uh, electrons per second that are called sky flux, um, the sky flux in itself is not the issue. It's the noise that's associated with it. So the noise is always the square root of the um, actual level. But in this case, I've just squared both sides. So I've got the read noise squared and the background level in electrons. And there isn't a golden rule, but a lot of people use a ratio of 10 to 1 um, for, for, that, for that setting. And it's calculated um, from the gain in electronics per ADU. Um, it's also calculated as far as the, the bit depth as well, because you have to be a little bit careful that um, everything you do with noise, you must measure in electrons. You can't measure at the final pixel value unless your gain is one electron per ADU. Um, and, and the problem you have, just a little an aside, some cam manufacturers talk about ADU, meaning the output value, and some talk about the ADU, meaning the output of the analog to digital converter inside the sensor, which can be 12 or 14 bit as well as 16 bit. So that, that can catch you out. And if you start to use pixel values, when it's a 12 or 14 bit ADC, um, you will mess up the equations because uh, the noise doesn't scale that way. Um, but the thing is, all these things you can pull out of data sheets. So the gain, um, the, the bit depth, the read noise, they're all in the data sheets. And if I bring up one quickly, um, especially if I can get a nice size of it, that's no good. Maybe not. I can't get the fit into the screen properly. It's it's um, downloaded off the QHY website, but unfortunately, it is very long and thin, so it doesn't it doesn't fill the screen properly. Um, but I, I what I've discovered is that QHY and ZWO measure their cameras very precisely, and I've never been more than a few percent out from the values that they publish, which is good news. So from now on, I just typically use what's on the data sheet. Um, and as I said before, sky limited exposure sets the lower limit. Um, and it isn't one value, it's several values. It's dependent on the level of light pollution. Um, it depends on the filters you're using and the gain settings all change that, that sky limited exposure. So I created a spreadsheet uh, with all these values from the, the sensor and some typical values of the sky flux in my, in my backyard. Um, I'm about 30 miles from the center of London, so my skies are not great. My typical exposure times for my deep sky images are 30 hours to 80 hours, depending on what it is. So um, I, I only get about four or five images a year if I'm lucky. Um, so uh, I think those near Washington probably will um, feel, feel for me. Uh, so I've taken an example camera and what I've done is I've looked at what I can physically get in terms of exposure over a 10 hour period. Um, and I'm using my semi rural sky, which is the sky flux of about five electrons per second, which I've measured. And with the two gain settings that I'm using, for example, so I've got a gain of zero or 1750. And the sky limited exposure is 76 seconds for the low gain and just five seconds for the high gain because the read noise drops dramatically with, with the gain. Um, but um, if you take into account uh, the, the, the download and dither overheads, you can calculate the, the signal to noise ratio for a stack of images. So in other words, all the photons that you collect from this, the background sky versus the averaged read noises. So at the lower gain, you actually get um, a signal to noise ratio of 382, which is higher than at the high gain, which is 229. 
And the reason is, is that the effective exposure time you get over that 10 hour period is less um, with the longer exposures. As, as you can imagine, a five second exposure is incredibly short and it's gonna take longer than that to download it, process it, dither, settle, and start the next one. So it's just something to take into account um, as a, a lower end bookend. Um, and what I typically do is my exposure times are normally set so that the brightest stars in the image are just starting to clip. There are very few central pixels, nothing more. Um, I don't typically get that many dropouts, so I can use nearly all my exposures. So this is what I will typically use. I will use 300 and 120 seconds is what I, I use at the moment. And what the effect is on my signal to noise ratio is at the low gain setting, it goes from the sky limited exposure at 332 up to 415 for the same 10 hour period. And for the higher gain, it goes up to 408. So interestingly, um, that every time you, uh, th these are just a simple ratio, but obviously if you could take log values, um, you can do it in, uh, in dB as well, but that's quite a significant jump. And with a cooled camera, dark noise doesn't really come into it, but for a, an uncooled digital SLR with no cooling, using these same times, that drops down to 336 and 329 from these two values. So that's a significant drop in signal to noise ratio simply because the dark noise starts becoming quite obvious uh, in those longer exposures. And that's the reason why, um, you know, DSLRs are, are, are good if you've got nothing else with you, but um, a cooled camera will always outperform a DSLR. And so, as I said, the upper exposure bookend I use is just the duration that just makes full use of the effective full web depth of the sensor, clipping just a few pixels in the brightest star cores. Um, I see a, a question from Chris um, about narrowband and yes, with narrowband, I, I will increase this. So 300 and 120 is for typically um, RGB and L. If I'm doing narrowband, uh, it typically goes up to 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but it's there's a couple of problems with CMOS cameras where really long exposures start to cause some other issues. Um, so the recommendation I have um, is if you've got robust tracking and infrequent dropouts, um, ultra short exposures are actually detrimental over a, a given Im imaging period. And that's uh, a longer one is actually somewhat better. And whoops, so, yes. So that's, that's, that's the end of that little bit. Um, and the, back onto the agenda, the next part on the agenda is talking about um, some of the uh, calibration gotchas. So I've been using a, a QSI CCD camera like um, half the planet has for the last 10 years. And I've only recently changed to CMOS. And um, this light blue line is looking at the, the median level of uh, dark frames going from naught all the way up to 900 seconds. And you can see that the dark current starts to accumulate and it starts off at a, a level of 240 and it gets up to almost 270 as the dark current accumulates in the exposures. Bizarrely, when you take a CMOS camera and all I've done is I've just shifted it by an amount so it starts at the same point, it, it actually sort of doesn't really change much and then it starts going down. And this is because CMOS cameras are semi-intelligent and they try to do um, built-in dark exposure compensation. So there's an area masked off from light on the actual sensor itself, and it measures the, the mean value, and it, it does a, some form of subtraction. It's not documented, but that's what it's doing. It's doing a, a form of subtraction to try and keep the mean level about right, because these cameras are designed, or the sensors are designed for normal photographers, and they don't want to see in a long exposure, their, their shadow is becoming gray. So why is this a problem? Um, well, the classical calibration technique 
subtracts a, a bias frame for every image frame. But if the image frame is actually already lower than the bias frame, which is zero seconds, you're going to potentially create yourself black pixels. And uh, even with, um, uh, with dark skies and a few other things, you can sometimes actually start clipping. So it's taken a little while. Um, I think Deep Sky Stack has finally got itself around the problem and has started to acknowledge that it needs to change its algorithms. Um, but Pixinsight equally has started to realize that uh, one, one calibration method doesn't suit all. Uh, and they're starting to sort of also work on uh, other ideas. And I think, um, yeah, there's I think one more slide and then we're back into Pixinsight. So you don't necessarily want to do something different for every sensor you have. And on the previous slide with that characteristic of the CCD and CMOS, not every CMOS camera does it, which is annoying, but enough do it to make it a problem. So one of the tricks is to find a calibration process that works for CCDs and CMOS and will just work. And the way to do it is um, you just basically ensure your darks and lights have exactly the same exposure conditions. That's the exposure duration, temperature, gain, and offset. Um, you, do, you do not use bias or optimize dark frames when you, you calibrate your flats. And you don't calibrate your flats with biases. Um, you calibrate them with a flat dark, which is basically a dark frame, which is the same exposure duration as the flats. And sometimes with flat exposures, it can be, um, especially if you're using an electroluminescent panel, you need to do several seconds or longer, otherwise you start getting striping on an electroluminescent panel, which are typically used with these um, devices that flip over the front of the telescope. Um, and unfortunately, electroluminescent panels at the same time don't give out much hydrogen alpha or sulfur um, wavelengths, you know, around the 700 nanometer mark. Um, so some of my flat exposures can be 30 seconds long for, for some, of my, some of my scopes. So matching flat darks, no bias or optimize. And these are settings that you can now set in the batch pre-processing script and also in these, the separate uh, um, processes if you do it manually. And the second trick, um, so don't have to write this down, uh, Alistair, because I'll, I'll send these slides to, to Kevin. Um, so you integrate your darks. Um, no normalization or waiting to form a master dark. That's, that's normal. Um, be careful if you're still using Maxim. I don't know about DL6, but DL5 it used to automatically uh, subtract biases to form a master dark, which you don't want to do. So the best way of not subtracting the master dark is never su to supply any in the first place. Um, and then next is to calibrate the lights with the master flat, the master dark. And again, don't use bias or optimize options. Um, then you, you register your calibrated lights. Uh, you do it after debayering um, on a color sensor. I did try it once. <laughs> I wonder if I got the image still. I did try debayering um, after I'd registered and you get something that looks like a bee's eye um, with a, a, a color interference pattern all over the screen, which is highly, highly amusing, but completely hopeless for astrophotography. Um, and then you integrate your lights um, with additive with scaling and weighting and, and so forth as you would normally do. So if I click on that, this calibration process at the same time also removes amp glow, which is a feature that's particularly prevalent in CMOS cameras. It's not uh, unheard of in CCDs, but less likely. So these are the, the same exposure. Um, it's not a, this is not a stack. Um, it's just a single one. And this is why I, I don't typically go much above uh, 10 minutes because this starts to get excessive. And while I can remove the, the, the glow in this, in this calibrated image, um, as some of you will already realize, with light comes noise. And if I was to do a noise map of this image, I would have a, a, a hand-shaped 
noise profile that was worse noise in this area than, than say, in this area. So if you use your flat darks and, and your flats, just as the way I said, you will completely remove um, the amp glow, which is a good thing. Um, because these these cameras are pretty sensitive uh, otherwise and so um i thought about quarter past four so uh, do you do we want us to pause for some questions before i go into pics insight or do you want me to just press on uh if anybody has any questions i, I think now would be uh good, uh, a good time to uh to ask them of chris there's a couple already posted. Oh um, yeah, uh, so I do see one from from Alex uh, in the in the chat. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, I haven't got, got my tag still. open. Right, um, right. Let's have a look. <laughs> I love the smell of developer in the morning. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's fixative. That's the one that I like. Yes. Um, what about the use of pedestal values? Uh, okay, so. I talked about gain and I didn't mention offset. So uh, what I do is I, I do some dark frames, single dark frames at my all my exposure settings. And I choose an offset value that gives me a median value for um, the dark frame of somewhere between 100 and 500. I try not to get above 500 for calibration reasons. Um, I don't want to get really into single figures uh, because it's a little bit too close to the, the margins. So the offset, um, which I think is what you're referring to as pedestal, um, is simply to make sure that I don't get pixel values that are clipped. And you can't use zero as um, the, the test case because I've discovered that at high gain, the actual clipped value is 16, uh, for instance, of one of my sensors. It doesn't, there isn't, you can't physically get lower than 16, but it's a constant 16 across the frame. So you know it's clipped. So um, you have to look for it varying with the offset value and just get it as, as low as feasible without getting too close to the, the cusp of it clipping. Um, and then what I do is I, I've just made myself a chart for all my cameras. I have um, three gain settings for each of my cameras uh, and three offsets. And I just use those, Those I don't continuously vary the gain. Um, I just have these three settings, low, medium, and high. And um, with the three offsets along with them. And they're the ones I use, which means I can do a calibration set of darks, which I can reuse. Uh, and it also means that with refractors in particular, I can actually also do um, a set of flat frames and reuse flat frames across different uh, images as well, as long as I haven't rotated the camera. So um, with, with the, the RC, because of the dust, I can't do that so much. Um, do the calculators for Skylight work well in your opinion? So these are all, Paul, what these are doing is they're using the same, um, the same idea of, uh, as I think it's in um, a book, um, two seconds. Uh, so there is this book called Lessons from the Masters, which is uh, by Robert Grendler, who's the editor, which is a, an amalgam of different uh, chapters from different pr practitioners across different areas of deep sky imaging. And the one that most people are referring to is the Stan Moore chapter, which is the first chapter in the book where he talks about sky limited exposures. And that, that is the basis of Nina, SharpCap, Sequence Generator Pro. It, it's, it is the, the basis of all of them. Um, the thing that I've done, uh, which is to look at the bigger picture, which is not look at a single exposure, but look at, um, you know, I have 10 hours of clear night, what am I going to get out of it? And that's the thing that I've developed. The one thing I, I physically can't do in that spreadsheet very easily is the, the randomized dropouts of a, a bad gust of wind or things like that. It's, it's difficult to model. Um, 
but it's certainly the things that are easy to model are the overheads that accompany the cameras. And that's one of the reasons that uh, CMOS cameras outperform CCDs you know, in any time span is my, my QSI camera used to take almost 20 seconds to download an eight meg file. Um, you know, that is, that's pretty slow. Um, and uh, that was a tremendous overhead if you're doing, you know, th three minute exposures or whatever. Um, right, let's have a look. Uh, what drives your choice of LM? That's a good question. So Vince, what I typically do is the dynamic range is slightly better at the low gain settings. So if I'm doing stars and I'm just literally capturing, as someone else has mentioned, they'll just do a couple of hours of star exposures and purely to capture stars and their color. So the last thing I want to do is clip the stars. I want the, the stars to all be within the range of the sensor. So I capture their color information. So I use low gain for stars, medium typically for galaxies and high for nebula. Um, with a nebula, um, obviously you have stars in with the nebula and they'll blow out. But what I typically do is remove them and fill in with stars I've captured at a, a, a shorter exposure time. Um, and from Joe, when you make your flats, you turn down your panel to take 30 seconds. Right, so with a ele electroluminescent panel, um, if you do very short exposures with a CMOS camera, you get uh, bands going across, a bit like when you try to take a video of a, of a TV. So you have to be, uh, I think, about half a second or longer in order not to get that variation. Um, so the bands get smaller and smaller as the speed, uh, as your exposures lengthen. So I, I always want to aim at a couple of seconds or longer. Um, it would be obvious if you were, so if you don't see, don't need to yeah, so one of the things about banding, um, you, if you think about uh, a flat field, it's, it's mid-gray on your monitor, and you don't particularly stretch it when you look at it as a flat field uh, frame, calibration frame, so you might not necessarily perceive any banding in it. But when you start applying that to an image and very slightly changing the, the multiplication of the image, and then you start stretching that image, that's when you might notice it. So um, when I can see it on the screen, I basically do an order of magnitude longer in exposure to make sure it's it's a very small value. And then I'm, I feel safe that later on in the processing pipeline, if I do you know, do an extreme stretch, I'm not going to suddenly um, uncover some banding issues that were actually caused by flat fielding. Um, then your dark flats just to the... Um, no, the answer is no, that the dark flats wouldn't adjust to the flats because it's a timing thing. So the fact the bands, are, if you take 10 flat exposures, uh, at very short exposures, the bands appear at different points in, in every image. So, uh, your, um, your dark flats wouldn't have any banding because, uh, sorry, your flat darks, you mean not dark flats, your, your flat darks don't have any banding because there is no light. Um, what it is is that the electroluminescent is a, is a flickering light, um, just like a TV is. So that's the that's the problem. So so make sure your flat exposures are a couple of seconds or longer, and you shouldn't have a problem with the electroluminescent panel. Okay. So um, shall I shall I continue? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think maybe why don't we go ahead and get started for on uh, where you're going to go with Pixinsight and then uh, get into that a little ways. And then when you're when you're ready, we can take a break for a little bit. OK, so I'm just going to shut Keynote down. Um, so now you should see uh, Pixinsight screen. Yeah, there it is. So um, there's a. There was an Eng English children's program called Blue Peter. It ran for decades, and it, there was a, always a couple of catchphrases. Here's one I here's one I, I made earlier. So what I've got here is a number of um, work screens, worksheets, 
with all the different things I'm going to take you through. Um, so the idea being that um, I don't have to do it on the fly and I can actually be more reliable as a result. So um, the first thing I thought I'd take you through is the batch, the new batch pre-processing script. Personally, I typically don't use it, um, but I did take a look at it for you um, to see what it was doing. It's quite interesting. Um, so I was going to bring it up and show you how it works. So the thing, uh, the key thing is it says weighted batch pre-processing. So the weighting is referring to the final integration. Um, I typically do not use uh, integration this way. I, I typically just get a, a, a set of um, registered images and I do the integration separately. But it's, it's good to get a, an idea of what your image looks like. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and add some files to it and see if it puts it in the right places. It's interesting. It's just, oh, I hate the whirly ball of death. Oh, there we are. So I've got a mixture of masters, flat darks, flats, and lights. Um, Chris, we, we can't see that. I, ah, you might need to share your whole screen instead of the window. Yeah. OK. So um, what can you see it now? Well, right now, all we're seeing is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Google screen that shows uh, all the participants in the meeting. Oh. So <laughs> OK. Uh, more settings to be experimented with. Yeah. I'll have to flip between them. That's so. You can see. Can a, you share your whole screen? It that, didn't. It didn't there do it. it. There you are. So I mean, right now we're seeing the the, the list of uh, uh, of files. Yeah. It looks like I might have to flip between them a few times. Um, we tried when we did the test run. Flip doing the whole screen made it very clunky. Uh, it sh slowed it down a lot. Hmm. Um, I can try it uh, once more, but let me just get these into the, the script and we'll go from there. So I've got a, a master dark that I've done before. Because I don't know what my flat exposures were going to be, I had to create some on, on the fly. And I've got some light frames. I haven't done too many, otherwise we'd be here till Christmas. Um, so I just open those and then I'm going to go to my Pixel Sight screen. So what I've just discovered is every window is separate, which is really annoying. So you can see the pre-processing script. Yes. OK, but nothing else. That's right. Uh, that is all we see right now, yeah. OK, well, that's, that's cool. That's all we need to see for the moment. Um, but what it's doing is it's, it's doing every window separately, which is entertaining. <laughs> mm. oh, it's, it's almost like using Nina. Right. Um, so. If I click on the different files, we want to just check it's got them in the right places. There should be no biases, which is good. Um, darks, I've got my master, which is shown with a little asterisk. Uh, and I think what it does is it checks for the word master in the file and works out it's a master. And the others, it knows it isn't a master. With the flats, um, I've got my three second flats um, for that particular filter. And on my lights, I have my 900 second exposures. And then there's an extra tab that appeared with the new script called Control Panel. And it, it gives you an overview of what's, what's happening. Uh, so the good news is, yes, it's identified everything correctly. It's a master dark. Um, it contains a bias, because I haven't subtracted the bias, which is good. If you say it doesn't have the bias, then it comes up with a warning message, um, which is appropriate. It tells me I've got nine frames of hydrogen alpha um, of, through the flat frames uh, and eight frames of hydrogen alpha through that. So everything looks good. And if you run the diagnostics, I bet that doesn't show. Let's just check. I'm just going to, if this is doing separate windows, I imagine that doesn't show. Yeah, so when, if you're I, clicking diagnostics, we're not seeing the response it gives you. So I'm going to try full screen again. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, is that showing anything at all? Well, right now, all we're seeing is the, uh, uh, you know, the list oh. of the Windows it's, 10. Um, it won't allow me to do it. It's, uh, it's just telling me I can't do it. So you're not going to be able to see a pop-up box? That is annoying. Just a bit. So are you presenting in, uh, are you sharing? I'm using, I'm using, using Google, Google Chrome. Chrome. I'm using Google Chrome and. Yeah, um, that, that should be the most friendly. You're on one uh, monitor or two? Uh, one. Oh, okay. But a big one. <laughs> yeah. I'll just have to flip between them. So there's the diagnostic messages. It says no bias frames, which is absolutely fine. And then I'm going to fart around with this again. <laughs> Sorry about um, that. Oh, that's okay. C'est la vie. Right. So back to this, and then you you hit run. So um, I'm worried this is going to be annoying. If PixInsight is going to sh mess up every window. It is. Oh, it's an artifact of the that, toolkit they use. I wonder. OK, so if I hit that, it will go through the process and do a report. I'm not going to actually do it because it just wastes a load of time. But that's the key the key part of it. Um, there are some other parts of this system that are quite useful. Um, so for instance, under the lights panel, there's some interesting parts here. There's cosmetic correction. So if, you, if your dark frames, for instance, are a little bit old, um, you could take a long exposure, open cosmetic correction, and you can find the settings that get rid of all the hot pixels, uh, drag the template to the desktop, and then hit apply and select whatever the, the, the name of the icon is here. And that'll do cosmetic correction in this order. So what it's doing is it's, it's doing um, cosmetic correction before it does the subframe weighting and the image registration. So that's one thing that I quite often do with CCDs, uh, especially the the old um, QSI one, because it 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 had a lot of uh, unusual hot pixels which came up out of nowhere. Um, you can do subframe weighting, and again, you can change the weighting parameters. This is the idea of this being that uh, it replaces you having to do it manually using um, the sub the subframe uh, selector script. Uh, so if you hit the waiting parameters, you can choose uh, some presets or you can move these sliders to give you a balance between star size, eccentricity, signal to noise ratio, um, and pedestal value, which is basically sky level. Um, so there's a couple of ones which they put in for you. Can you shout out if you can't see what I'm doing. Um, yeah, we can we can see you changing those settings. Okay, so that that's quite handy. Um, in terms of uh, registration, if you want to take all year to do it, you click generate drizzle data if you don't need it, and that takes a lot longer. So make sure that doesn't uh, have checked. Uh, registration parameters typically. Um, there's one thing that you do particularly want to set. You can leave this on auto. But if you choose one of these, make a note of it, because later on when you start to do um, noise reduction, whatever the image um, uh, interpolation at the registration stage was, you want to use the same method. Um, it, the automatic setting nearly always uh, decides to use Lanxos uh, 3. Um, but it's not always the case. It nearly always is Lanxos 3. But, um, and if you start to have problems with registration, you best thing to do is change the log sens sensitivity. Um, and again, if you hold your mouse over it, it will give you a little pop-up box that says um, which way to push it in order to make it more or less sensitive. Uh, and again, if you want to do image integration uh, to see a, a quick and dirty image, there's a bunch of integration parameters. Uh, it has got pretty much the same range as the normal tool. Um, I nearly always leave it on Windsorized because it seems to do the best job. Uh, one thing that it is worth thinking about is the combination method, median, average, minimal, maximum. If you do average, uh, 
you need to consider that you've got 100 frames um, that are almost identical. And then you have one frame that's completely out of it. It's got a, a, a plane going over it or a satellite or one of Elon Musk's little, little um, array of satellites, which is annoying everyone at the moment. Now, if you do average, then the effect of all those satellite trails will be on every that will be averaged into the, the hole and you'll get these very faint satellite trails on your final stack. If you do the median, so the difference between average and median, median is looking at a, a sorted uh, array of values. So it takes every pixel in every image and says, if I put them all in order of size um, and then take the middle value, that's the one I'm going to use. So if there was, 99 images are all practically the same, and one image that was a complete outlier, the median value would completely throw out that outlier through the combination process, even if it didn't um, fully get rejected by um, the winds rise sigma clipping. It doesn't always it doesn't always happen that way, um, especially when you have. Um, I was imaging uh, last night. Uh, I was imaging um, a galaxy, and the very first frame had two plane trails and the the two plane trails did a cross and it the cross was right in the middle of the galaxy it was like don't believe it <laughs> the, so yes um but it will come out with the right processing parameters um now i think joe asked me some questions about sigma low and sigma high and what they mean so uh in industry uh, there's there's a, a something called six sigma in manufacturing industry, and the idea is is that your all your product um, has very very low variability in terms of you don't l let out anything that's bad, and uh, and if you are only operating at say three sigma, then a fair proportion of what you manufacture will get out and it'll be bad. So one of the um, the ways of thinking about this is the sig sigma here is talking about a distribution of values and it's a, it's a statistical distribution and when you get to a single sigma um i'm trying to remember the values i think it's about 60 something percent 65 68 something like that so 68 percent of your values lie within one standard deviation and when you get to two and three and four standard deviations, that rapidly decreases. So by the time you get to uh, three or four sigma, you're talking about 98% um, of your distribution that you're, that you're holding on to. So by increasing this value, it will actually include more of your values from your, um, from your image. And by decreasing the value, it will be more likely to reject um, uh, the tails of the distribution. So your your most common um, value will be around the median on, on any pixel, and then higher and lower it will gradually become less and less frequent across your images. So this is just a, a, a normalized way of talking about range. Um, and it but it took but the nice thing is is it takes into account how much uh, variation there is in your signal so for instance if you've got um, an image that you're taking during the night and it's gradually getting a lot darker as the as the sun sets further um, these these things take some account of it there's a bit of normalization that goes on that allows for the values to be um, comparable but uh, if you have more of a sky gradient, for instance, then you'll get a, a, a broader range of, of values and so forth. So typically, most people just want to know what to set it to. So around the three and four mark is where I start off. And if I need to exclude uh, a very pesky um, you know, satellite trail or whatever, I might reduce one of these uh, slightly further, maybe down to not normally much below three occasionally to about two and a half but um and that should get rid of it and sometimes the best thing to do is just find that frame and discard it so i'm going to exit that 
and change my present screen and move it to Pix and Site. Hopefully. Sorry, so, it's a technical challenge here. Yep, so you can see Pix and Site screen. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. So uh, what I've done is um, I just check I've got the right one. Uh, ah, that's the one I want. So the stack that we were talking about, um, this is the result of the stack of those those nine frames. Um, and what I was going to do was show you, uh, let me just pull those in. One of the most annoying things with Pixel Sites is it, it doesn't pull these images in. If you shrink this screen up and down, you just, <laughs> You just lose them, which is somewhat annoying. Um, so there's a couple of things I wanted to show you. One was uh, reducing noise, um, and the other one was also taking stars out. Another one was also deconvolution. So uh, this particular one I'm looking at here is looking at um, uh, something called demure. Um, so this is, uh, I think it must be named after somebody, but it's, it's a noise reduction technique. So uh, if I just pull up this image here, which is a smaller, it's just a crop of it. So I can just, it's a bit faster if I run on a smaller image. And it's its stretched. So it's got a screen stretch. So that's why the green bar is down the side. And if I pull up this noise reduction script, it's going to play up again. Ah. And you can't see that. Brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, we cannot see the. I yeah, think the problem is we can't see the pop up boxes. Don't worry. I'm just going to. Uh... So, this is uh, the demur, um, de oh, sorry, Muir denoise script. Um, and it basically uses two parameters from your camera and some parameters from the stack and it magically reduces image noise. And it, it can be quite remarkable. Um, I mean, how? just a sh show of hands, does, how many people have used this before? OK. I definitely have. So one of the good things is, I was saying earlier that the, the CMOS cameras by QHY and Zwo, their parameters that they um, put up on their, their specifications are highly accurate. I have, there is a script that measures it, but I've, I've used the values um, in the script and also in here, and they're practically identical. So one of the things that you have to be careful about if you're a first time user is um, there's something called DN here, which means a data number. So data number means it's like the pixel value. And that's not the same as the number coming out of the uh, ADC. So you just have to take that into account. Uh, and so for instance, um, this, this is a 14-bit camera. So this value is four times lower than it would normally be if you just looked up the data sheet. And again, the Gaussian noise um, is, uh, again, it's based on data number. So in this case, it's four times higher than it normally would be. So if you divide that by four, that's what the Gaussian noise is really like in terms of electrons. Um, don't need an offset in this particular case, and I don't need a flat field. Um, so the latest version of the script auto-populates um, the combination count because it picks it out of the fits header of the image. And you know, I was mentioning about the interpolation method during uh, registration. So you need to select the one that was used. Um, now, what would typically happen is this would be set, this value here would be set to one. And I think the default value might be 12. I'm not sure what it is, but these values are a little bit too aggressive and you cre can create a, um, it, almost like a lizard effect of scales going across the image. So I typically back these off a little bit around the 0 0.6, 0 0.7 mark and drop this back a little bit um, and then hit denoise and this will this will run and it does carry on going so um, the good thing is if i just want to check myself 
I just dismiss that for a second? Ah, oh, no, it didn't save it. I'll have to run it. Ah, I thought I'd saved it so I could just play it back on the, the main screen. Ah, right, great. Where are we? There we are. Sorry about that. I'm just going to run it. Okay. Uh, right, go back to that. Present now. So it takes a, a, few, a few seconds for each cycle, and I'm just going to let it continue. And hopefully, this will work. Right, let's dismiss that. So you should see my Pixel Insight screen again. And if I zoom in one on one and then hit go back, oh, that's made it's interesting. It hasn't done anything at all. Uh, yes. Very interesting. It doesn't seem to have done anything at all, which is uh, novel. It's unusual. For it's a good, clean camera. No. Chris, I've actually run into this once in a very long time, uh, uh, never with narrowband images, but, but only with LRGB images, and only on the luminance frame. And I've asked that question. And I've never really gotten an answer to why would it uh, have an effect sometimes and other times not. And I, you know, it's rare. It almost always does. But there have been times that I've seen it have no visible effect whatsoever. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, try again. This will be much faster because I've just done a small preview. Right. There we go. At okay. work that time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is before and after. So you, it's not. The good news is, um, on my screen, I can see all the the small uh, high frequency noises disappeared, but it hasn't replaced it with any weird, like a scaly. A, it's, it's like a, like lizard scales. Um, if you go over the top, it it um, it gets a bit strange. And I haven't altered the um, the stretching. If I redo the screen stretch, because it's a smoother image, it will stretch it more. So if I hit screen screen stretch again, you start to see there's it's just starting to cr break up the image a little bit, but not too badly. Again, if I go back, that's before and after. So that's with a much uh, stronger stretch so that's that's one thing that some people don't that they don't explore the scripts so they, they kind of passed it by um, and I typically do this before doing deconvolution um, so that's that's one thing I want to show you um, let's get the right one Oops, uh, find the right one all right. So the second one was to do with removing stars altogether. Um, so if I bring this up again. Uh, Chris, uh, Juan had a question about, is uh, this the first thing you do before you, you do anything like DBE? Yes. Uh, the only thing I'll sometimes do is I might crop the image. If I've got a... a the thing about some of these scripts is you have to be a little bit careful about whether they use image values to change the way they behave. So to be on the safe side, um, I'll do my mainstream image cropping uh, across all my frames before doing this. Um, but yeah, it, it's you want to do it because if you think about it, picks, um, deconvolution accentuates image noise so if you're going to take noise out it's better to do it before you accentuate it um, and also the reason that uh, 
muir denoise has to be done like the first thing um, is because it's using some some mathematical algorithm that says if you take a bunch of x images with these parameters um, and you stack them um, then this is the algorithm that will remove the noise. And if you do anything else to the image, like stretch it or do something else, you destroy that relationship of, of that algorithm. I don't know how it does it. It's uh, it's quite clever. Um, I know that. Um, but um, it's sometimes better than trying to sort of fix noise later on when you've already amplified it. So what I was going to do now was look at another fairly recent um, change to PixInsight. So initially, this was a, a, a separate module used to bring in, which has now been fully integrated, which removes stars. So um, it's not a script. It's actually a process. Um, and I think it's under masks, if I'm rightly. Yes, yeah, Starnet. So can you see the Starnet box, or has that disappeared? No, we I can't cannot. Tell. Sorry about that. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's. That's going to be. Oh, that's going so to. So when you you know when you popped up Mir18, oh well maybe you had to switch even for Mir18 noise, didn't you? So maybe this means that each for each process you also have to switch. Yeah, each one is a separate window. Ah. Uh, oh well. I, I like a challenge. <laughs> if all your challenges were in astrophotography only, just imagine how boring life would be. That's interesting. It doesn't show. It doesn't show up as soon as oh, that's that's not going to work because as soon as I click outside of PixInsight, the StarNet dialog disappears. So when I it doesn't appear on, you know, a window for me to share. Right. Ah, oh, goodness. I have a feeling. I, I'm going to have a, can I make a suggestion? Can we have a, a, a short break in which time I'm going to see if I can change my um, privileges to allow Google to share my entire screen? Yeah, I, the, this is probably a great time for that. And we can, uh, we can do a little messing with yeah. the settings while, we, while we're on a break. Okay. Does that make sense? Except that it doesn't really work very well. Um, when your image is not stretched. And at the moment, it's only a screen stretch. So what I'm going to do is just take a clone of this image, uh, get rid of that one there. So this is the clone. And I'm going to apply a very uh, low stretch to it. So intensity transformations, histogram. Um, and I'm just going to drag that up. I'll get rid of that. So just, just so that I can start to see some stars, nothing more. Hey, uh, Chris, can I make a suggestion? Uh, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, I think maybe Chris can close the, the sidebar or at least minimize the, the, the sidebar uh, that's specific for uh, 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 Google Meet. Uh, and maybe that would allow enlarging the, uh, the PixInsight screen. Yeah, yeah, correct. Have you, can you see my desktop? Yes, we can yes. see the whole desktop. We can now. see your full screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. now you can you can put pics inside as large on the on the desktop as you want. Okay. I won't I won't know if anyone has asked a question because I haven't got that window up, obviously. Ah, yeah. okay. Well then I will you have just... to keep an eye on the chat then. I'll do that. Okay. For you. So all I've done is just done a very mild stretch. I've got some stars appearing, nothing more. I'm going to apply it and then get rid of the preview. So this was on a clone of the image. And you can see just a sprinkling of white dots. And then run this on here. I've never changed the one setting, which is called stride. I haven't a clue what stride means. I don't think it's an acronym. Um, oh, it's a slow one. Oh, hang on. So I'm going to stop that. Uh, I'm going to make this a lot faster by cropping the image, which I think would be welcomed. The trouble is I resized my PixInsight screen and therefore all my icons are now in different p positions and all my muscle memory has completely gone out the window, which is quite <laughs> hilarious. So there we go.
Right. Hopefully that's a bit faster. In your own time. Come on. Wakey, wakey. That's better. This is a, a Mac Mini I'm running on. It's a six core i7 Mac Mini. So it's quite a powerful little computer. Um, and my stars have disappeared. Well, you'll have to. What I really should have done was done stretch the screen stretch before and afterwards. So yes, the stars have gone. Sometimes you're left with a little bit of a halo. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily too bad because bear in mind that this is stretched. So sometimes what you have to consider is if it's on a narrow band, you might have to do a little bit of cloning around some of these to get rid of them. Otherwise, you might get a weird colored halo around a star later on. Um, if not, um, it, when you put the stars back in, it'll actually disguise the effect. If you want to make uh, an image of all your stars, then you can use pixel math and this, subtract this from your other image and you'll get a, a, a star image um, back. Or you can hit this button here called, say, create star mask, and it creates the opposite. It does just that for you automatically. Um, and that sometimes is useful. Uh, if you want trying to do star substitution and get the color into the stars. So that's, that's been helpful. I've, I, the other ways of getting rid of stars was to try and shrink them down gradually using morphological transformation. Um, I don't know about you, but I've never had a great deal of success with it. Uh, this is definitely better. Um, not perfect, but better. And bearing in mind that you typically remove stars off narrowband images, which are going to be stretched a lot. Uh, the, the stars really start getting ugly when they get stretched. So this certainly helps. Um, yeah, that's, that's been my experience too, that, that, that StarNet has given me much better results than morphological transformation ever did. Yeah. So one thing that uh, is interesting to discuss, at least be interesting to see and compare what we all do but if i just come back and get rid of this just put a screen stretch back on when you do your initial stretch of an image what do you use so i usually use histogram transformation so what i've ended up doing a lot of is a mild histogram transformation nothing too extreme followed by masked stretch. Have you ever done that? I have toyed with mass stretch. Well, I, I've tried mass stretch a lot, um, but I almost always wind up going back to, you know, doing the, the manual stretching with, with curves and maybe more histogram transformations. And I, like, I find that mass stretch gets me close, but, uh, and it's easier, <laughs> but I find that, uh, Somehow or another, I, I almost always wind up with a slightly more results that I prefer a little bit better uh, doing all the stretches manually. If yeah, with the with the default setting of mass stretch, it, it is quite an extreme stretch because of the clipping fraction here. If that if you actually remove that and and bung that on there, it actually uh, is not as extreme as you imagine. I just need to get rid of the screen stretch. So that's the mass stretch on a, an image, just just plain. So it's actually not, it's not too weird. Um, if you screen stretch it, you, you get your image back. But the beautiful thing is, is it keeps the stars small. But the way I typically use it is I, I do a, a mild stretch and then a masked stretch. So if I come back out of that um, and apply this, first of all, and put in a very, very small value, something like that to there, and then put that into there. And get rid of the screen stretch. Um, it, what it does, and, 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 I, and, I, and that, the thing about stretching is not to go too far too early. You can always stretch more later on, but you can never unstretch. Um, the other trick that I would look at very carefully is with histogram transformation. If I zoom into this image, double side, and look at some of these pixel values, they're starting to get quite bright. Um, so what I 
use is this number down here. And for instance, if I've got a few pixels that are just clipping right from the get go, um, if I go back to the unstretched image and do a screen stretch only, some of these bright ones might just start to clip. And what I'll do is when I do this initial stretch, I'll give myself some more headroom by just putting an extra 10% on here. And when you drag that to, to here, it means that, oh, I'll get rid of the screen stretch, none of the stars will, will get to, to, to 0.99 or whatever. So if you're like me and like good star color, um, you, you never want your stars to get really above about 0.9 in value. So I always keep tabs on where the stars are in terms of their brightness. Um, so there's some bright ones here, but if I look at them, the value down the bottom is 0 0.5. So it's not too bad at the moment because it's not a, an extreme stretch, um, but it, it just keeps things in check. And so at various points, I, I, I normally have one of these set aside. So if I reset this, and then just simply change that to 1.1 and then drag that to here and call it headroom. I will use this frequently throughout the process. So before I do a sharpening process, which also increases local contrast, I'll just drag this onto here and reduce the highlights a little bit. And I do that because in effect, during the processing um, workflow, you're increasing contrast either locally or globally and so you don't want to start getting to the point of your whites clipping and then you never get the star color back in so uh, the other thing you sometimes have to do is conversely on the darks so if you are doing local contrast like um, intensity transfer and local histogram equalization this will actually make uh, dark areas darker as well as light areas lighter whereas this is only making light areas lighter so sometimes before applying this if it's particularly aggressive i will also put in a negative value here typically something like five percent and that just lightens the background a little bit so if i drag that onto here whoops it will just lift the background up so that if I then apply local histogram transformation, it will not create a problem where um, it starts to hit black. So if I hit the preview on this, it's not gonna do a great deal because it's not stretched enough because I think I've taken all the stretches out. Um, but I would typically apply this to either Nebula or a Galaxy if I want to enhance uh, you know, things like those tidal flows that you're talking about. This is very good for tidal flows. Um, this one here, local histogram transformation, um, because it, it, it'll accentuate on a much larger scale than a normal sharpening process. And typically I'll run this uh, three times. I run it around the 300 mark with 12 bit, knock this back a bit and knock this back a bit, and then run it again around the sort of 160-ish mark and then down about the 70s or 80s. And, but but not go too much, just a little bit. Um, and it'll just lift, you know, like M101 with those very faint arms that stick out. It'll just lift those arms up a little bit. And as I go down in scale, I go down in the bit depth. Otherwise, you get something that looks like curdled milk. Um, OK, so I'm just losing myself a little bit here. So we've talked about Demure and Starnet. And the reason that we take the stars out is when we stretch the images and we want to apply, as was mentioned earlier, linear fit to the narrowband images. Mm -hmm. If you've got bright stars in your image, it messes up the linear fit. Um, whereas if you take the stars out and you do a linear fit between your hydrogen, oxygen and sulfur, you get a, a, a better, better result. So talking about that, it's probably a good time to look at narrowband color. So these are three stacks that are already stretched. I'm not fully stretched because again, I don't want to saturate them. Um, and they've been linear fitted uh, to each other. Um, these ones have actually got the stars in um, right from the word. Uh, and the thing about 
narrowband is they can be combined in different ways. And there's the classic Hubble Space Telescope setting, um, which tends to make everything very green. Um, but even if you have normalized them with linear fit and you do it, um, I think, which one is it? It's this one here. You get something a bit like this if you apply a standard Hubble um, telescope palette to it. But with the same three images, you can do something quite different um, or more naturalistic. And these, all I've done is I've blended the channels. So instead of making sulfur pure red and hydrogen pure green, what I've done is I've, I've blended them together and you can create different effects, uh, sometimes a, a good deal more subtlety. I'm not a huge fan of um, the sort of the monochromatic blues and oranges that people get. Um, and I did do some experimentation with color mask and shifting the color values, which you can do. Um, but it's a lot can be achieved with a script. It's not part of the standard PixInsight uh, download, but you if you do a search, you'll soon find it. Um, and it's called the SHO AIP script. Um, and it's by uh, an, a French astro imaging group. And it brings up a, a window which allows you to uh, select your images. And you can select not just only your narrowband, but you can also select uh, you can select RGBs as well. You, so you can, if you've got RGB, uh, G is uh, vert, uh, is gr French for green. So green is V instead of that. So you, you can you can play around with this. You can also add in luminance as well, although I'm not going to use it in this particular case. And down here, you've got your red, green, and blue channels in your color image. And you can play around with these sliders and you can add in different contributions of your different narrowband filters. And you get a preview of what you get on the screen when you hit apply. And you can do two versions. You can just do the um, the color channels, or you can also do uh, a luminance on top of that using the luminance layer. So typically, I play around the colors and get that right. And then I'll, I'll do that afterwards. So you can play with these. What you typically do is try not to get these to exceed 100. Otherwise, you, you, you might clip. There are a couple of other little settings that will equalize and try and get the background right. But I typically don't use them. If you've done the linear fit, your background value and your peak values uh, and your median values are about the same. So um, I typically uncheck these um, and then just, just play around with them. And you get, you get an image. So if I hit OK, it'll produce an image, um, except I didn't Press the wrong button. Haha. <laughs> That's annoying. Uh, right. But one of the beautiful things is when you have a setting, these load and save buttons down the bottom here, because I, I spent about a day putting this presentation together, I've actually got one I prepared earlier. So uh, I just need to find out where I put it. Um, I think it's that one there. That's HST. Is that? Thought I had another one. Oh well. No, just that one. All right. Let me just check. Uh, MB one. Hi, Chris. Uh, when you get a second, um, yep. I'm not yep. sure what you are referring to when you say linear fit. You don't have to answer it right now, but maybe if no, that's, later on that's, you could explain that's, it. That's okay. So. If you think of the histogram of an image, um, they're typically rather strange with virtually everything in the black. Um, you can kind of match the general shape of the histogram of one image to the other images. And you do it by simply altering the endpoints. You don't do a, you don't alter the midtones um, by using a gamma slider. So it's one of the um, processes here. I can never remember which one it is. It's linear fit. Here we are. So what you typically do is choose a reference image, and it normally is the brightest, like hydrogen alpha. And then what you do is you drag it and apply it to your other images. And when you do that, um, so for instance, if I deliberately mess this up by stretching it 
badly. So uh, if I make this much darker by doing that, and then apply this to there, it should bring it back up again. I've never done this before. There we go. Hey, look at that. Hey, thank you very much. Now I understand it. It's almost so, a little so, bit like the dynamic crop tool in a sense. Yeah, yeah. It's um, the thing about linear fit is it, it it's and the word linear is important. It's it's a linear transform. It just scales the pixel values. It doesn't alter the relationship to one another. Whereas anything with a curve, when you move this bit here, that's nonlinear. Okay, that's that's a nonlinear stretch. But if I reset that and just move that point and that point, that's a linear stretch. So you can still you can't you can, for instance you can't decom well, you don't get such good results when you deconvolve a nonlinear image, but you can deconvolve an image that's um, had linear fit done to it because as far as it's concerned it's it could, the gain the gain of the camera and the offset of the camera could have just been different. It doesn't make any difference. You haven't altered the data. I can completely recreate that data by moving that back out again, the way it was. So, um, uh, so if you have gone, somebody else. I just said thank you. Uh, I just said uh, thank you. So. It's worth experimenting when you've got your narrowbands and you've got a rainy afternoon. Just try some different combinations. And uh, there's no right combination. I mean, I stuck it up on one of the forums and uh, I initially stuck this one up and then some said, oh, I don't like that. So I quickly, within moments, came up with a different one. And I went, oh, no, that's too artificial. And, and a chap who's well known who wrote, Quite a few ascom drivers a chap called chris Rowland, said i like it more subtle so this is called chris's version which is is closer to reality um you go, oh yes i like that one so you can play and literally within minutes come up with multiple versions and the other thing to remember when you talk about manipulations and things you don't have to accept um what you see as as a final result so for instance if i brought up pixel math and I simply added these three together, which would be quite fun if they will work. Who knows? Only one way to find out. If the geometry is different, it won't work. But uh, let's see. Oh, OK. The reason that did that is because I forgot to um, rescale the result. So hit rescale result and hit again. Undo it first. So what I've done is combine the three images you had on screen to, to form another one. So there's lots of things you can do and play with, and um, there's endless experimentation. Uh, the other thing you can do if you truly want to, is go into pixel math itself and actually do the manipulation directly. But that's all the script is doing. Um, and there is one other to do narrowband, which is in here. Uh, I've got to find it. Um, uh, utilities. I've, I always forget where this one here. So it looks very similar. I think it was written by the same people. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but the idea being that um, it's trying to add narrowband to an existing color image to sort of enhance it. So for instance, there was a gentleman that had a picture of a galaxy, but he hadn't taken any narrowband yet. Um, so for instance, you could take your RGB um, galaxy here and then add um, some HA to your red channel, for instance, or whatever. And you can you can alter um, what it's doing and so forth. So there's a couple of things you can do just to enhance something as well. One of the things I typically do with reds and hydrogen alphas is I'll combine them. And 
the other thing that I'll sometimes do as well is that with these narrowband images, they've all got useful color information, but they also have got useful um, uh, detail as well. Um, so if you just simply take luminance frames, you will get something that looks pretty awful. But if you take um, all the images and combine them, you can average three up, uh, nothing less than three images. But if you average the three images and weight them according to their noise after linear fit, you can create an overall luminance frame and, and make the most of all that data that you've accumulated. So quite often, if I do LRGB, I'm not, I'll take the luminance information from the red, green, blue and add it to the luminance as well, which further reduces the noise. Uh, so it's just something that, it's easy just to think of the RGB as being color information, um, but actually it sometimes is quite useful at providing luminance data as well, which you can add to the rest of the luminance. So, I mean, this, this was taken with a refractor, um, probably, might be the tack, I can't remember. They change, <laughs> they change too frequently. <laughs> um, but yes, at one to one, there's a little, you're getting micro, um, micro lens crosses. This isn't a, an RC uh, camera. This is because of the degree of stretch, you're picking up diffraction on the micro lenses of the sensor. This was taken with um, a CCD. So yes, anyway, so that was one other one. I think one of the other ones that people wanted to know was about deconvolution. So let's have a look. Just need to get myself in the frame, so to speak. Right, I'm not quite sure why I've got two. Let's shrink that one down for a second, move that out of the way. So when you do deconvolution, um, you're on a linear image. This has been screen stretched, as you can see by the green bar. Um, you can actually do two things with deconvolution. You can actually enhance the star sizes, which everyone obviously thinks about, but you can also uh, enhance uh, nebula detail as well, or galaxy detail, because it's it's not just attacking stars, it's attacking everything. So if I'm going to do this effectively, I'm going to take a preview window, and I'm going to just take a section through here and use that because it'll make things uh, more qu quickly, but also it will demonstrate across a range of different um, types. The, the th Just to go back, um, one of the things I've noticed, if you do a preview screen, and, and if you just did a preview in this area up here, it and then apply it to the entire image, it doesn't work very well. So what I've learned is you, you need to have a preview area that, that covers a range of of values, and it seems the preview then seems to be a better predictor for the rest of the image. Um, not entirely sure why, but that's just something I've picked up. So there's our image, and this is our deconvolution algorithm. Now, one of the things that I've done here, just to make life easier for myself, is all my processes are, are on the screen. Now, normally you you pick them off here. But what I've done to, to try and keep time short is I've, I've already come up with the values that will work for me, and then I've saved it to the screen as, a, as an icon. So I can disable everything and show you where I start, um, and then don't have to sort of fiddle around with the values each time. But the, the way I've found that deconvolution works best is if you, if you treat each of these in turn. So for instance, um, I turn off wavelet, I turn off de-ringing, and then just look at the PSF and the, the algorithm itself to start with. And when I've got that right, then I start to enable de-ringing and look at that, that setting. And then I do wavelet regulation, regularization. The reason for that is that if you don't, you will end up going around in circles all the time. Um, this seems to be a, a, a way through that's almost linear. The, th the thing to know about the de-ringing and the wavelet is it tends to undo what you've done with the original deconvolution up here. So if you've got some slight ringing artifacts here, just um, only slight ones, they will get lessened by the de-ringing here 
and then the wavelet regularization down here as well. So um, if you try to perfect these, they'll actually, if you do them too well, they completely undo what you've tried to do up here. So the first thing to do is to, to find your stars and to define what they call um, a point spreading function. And there's a, a, there's a button to do that. There's the image of it. So there's my wonderfully sharp refractor that I did. It's unfortunately, it's not something you can actually show on here. You have to bring it up because it's one of those weird ones that doesn't uh, save on the screen. So it's under image. It's called dynamic PSF. And it comes up with a box and you basically click your bright stars. And I'm gonna click a few. And what it does is it tries to analyze the stars and you try, the idea is, is you pick, if this was the whole picture, I would want to pick stars covering the whole area of the picture, including the corners, because if you had uh, a little bit of curvature, it would, um, at one end, it would try and apply it, uh, the same sort of correction across the whole frame. Because the nice thing about this is if you did have uh, a degree of tilt, it'll actually cancel the tilt out because the PSF is not a, um, a 2D um, thing, it's a 3D, it's got three dimensions, it's got intensity, uh, width and height. So I'm just going to, to select those for the moment. Um, you typically look down these values and see if there's any ones that look a bit odd. Typically the Gaussian ones are the ones that are a bit odd. So I'm gonna remove that one and remove that one, which tends to be what I call the bloaters. And then I'd select these by shift clicking that and then hitting this button down here and export an image. And that'll export this image here. And it creates an image that is what happens to a point light source. And that's the, the characteristic image for this, this um, picture. And then the first thing to do is try and deconvolve it. So I start with the default 10. I, under external PSF, I choose this file here, which is called PSF. And then I drag this onto here and away it goes. And immediately you can see all the stars are shrunk um, and I've got black banding around all of them. So what I typically do is look at the very smallest stars to see what's happened to them. And they've got a very mild, black line around them, very, very tiny indeed. So if I zoom in two to one, um, just these sort of very, just a tiny black line. So that's probably about right. Um, so what I'm now going to do is, is put some de-ringing in. The default value is normally around 0.1. So I just need to click on that, uh, reset, and then try again. And that's what happens when you overdo the de-ringing. It makes a complete and utter mess of it. So I normally start at around 0 0.05. And thank you. Don't do that. Hmm. Interesting. Try again. Ah, I see what it's done. It's gone back to itself, 0 0.05. So it's still over the top. It's not, it's got over. So I'm going to try 0 0.001. It restart and try again. It's, it's getting there slowly. So this is not enough. It needs to be higher. So what I'm looking for is the faintest dark circles around these stars, which have got a fairly dark background. Um, so I'm going to go back to the number I, I knew of before. And unfortunately, it's a case of experimentation. So there it did it. If I, if in case you blinked, so before, after the stars have got smaller and there's a little bit of a halo the other thing 
to watch out for. Your eye and brain will see a dark halo around a, a white spot because especially when it's been bright, if you just do this and then immediately look when you do that, you see all the dark rings. If you look away uh, from the screen and then do that and then come back to it, you don't see the dark rings so much. So there's a bit of um, visual uh, sort of magic going on with your eye and brain there. And that's probably about the right value. You, it's not going to give you pinprint stars, but the thing is, notice that the nebulas have got a bit better as well. So if I, the nebula's got a little bit more definition as well, and, and especially galaxy uh, dust lanes will benefit. But the background noise has started to pick up a little bit. And also some of the brighter stars have got, um, still got some dark rings around it. And that's where the local deringing comes in. And what you need is a star map for to fix that. So this would be my star map. Now you think, well, okay, it's, it, we're into masks again. How do you do that? So, whoops. So the way I do that is quite simple and it's an alternative way of doing a mask, a, a, a star mask. So if you drag this, come on, drag this off here and go into, um, Multi-scale processing, multi-scale linear, and increase the layers, I've noticed about six. Remove the residual layer. Um, sorry, this it's interesting, it keeps on flipping the scope back. So there's my star mask, that was quite easy. Um, I just need to uh, stretch it because at the moment this is unstretched. So stop it, go away. Right, this thing keeps on going into scope all the time. I don't know why. So I just need to amplify it, which is basically a histogram transformation. It looks pretty awful, um, and you can always back it off a little bit. Oh, it's, it's screen stretched as well, which is why. So there's my star mask, um, and I can call it a name. So in this case, I've called it local support. So here's one I prepared earlier. So there's my star mask. And just before doing that, sometimes what I'll do is I'll blur it very slightly because um, just you don't want a hard edge mask. You just want a, a slight, subtle one. So uh, there's a something called convolution. So I'll apply that to the star mask which just softens it a little bit. And then take my image, which I've lost. That one there, the preview. And then click on local support. Um, now, the other thing to do is you don't want it, it'll default to one, which is uh, like double the amount. So I, I normally back off to somewhere between 20 and 50% and then drag that to here and it will redo the convolution again and again if you if you back off here the stars are getting smaller still but the the dark rings around them are better there still is a dark ring around them because the next process will also blur the stars slightly and reduce the effect of rings so the trick is not to try and completely take the rings out at each stage seems to be the trick um, so wavelet regularization is um, a sort of uh, a noise um, a denoising system that's done on the background. Um, I think actually it might be doing on the whole image. Um, it normally defaults to two wavelet layers. I normally do three. And again, rather like with noise reduction, you start off with higher degrees of noise reduction at the lower scales and, and moving up. And then I drag that to here. And then with that enabled, what I'm looking for now is that the background doesn't change. When I flip, my background is, does not get curdled. It's not showing excessive noise, but my stars are shrunk in size. Um, so that's deconvolution, the way I do it. And the trick seemed to be to follow it in the order down the tool. This last one called dynamic range extension, I don't normally worry about um, because my Images are well within the boundaries of, uh, you know, I don't remember 
deconvolution again changes local contrast so if you're going to uh, cause a problem where your contrast is going to bloat out you might need to do something with these but if you stay within the limits then this should be good so um are there any specific questions about deconvolution I don't think I see any here. Chris, hey, Chris. Chris. <laughs> there's been a this kind is, of uh, Alex Gorbachev. Hey guys, um, there's a bunch of questions on the chat. Joel uh, was asking because yeah. I can't see that. Um, hang on. Oh, okay. okay now. You want me to read it? Um, no, no, I, I've got. No, I've got it now. I've pulled it up. Right. It's just that with the two running side by side, it slows things down, Alex. You got it. Um, Okay. Uh, there's a couple. Yes, there's a couple of things that I should mention about deconvolution. You have to be oversampled, so um, you need several pixels, uh, multiple pixels, to cover a star. If you have stars that are single pixels um, on a, an image, typically uh, that happens um, with wide field shots with short lenses uh, and small pixel cam uh, large pixel cameras. Um, you can't use deconvolution. Um, so, um, and the the other thing just to note is that this this uh, star shape here is fairly symmetrical. It doesn't have to be. And if you do have um, slightly elongated stars for whatever reason, maybe there's a bit of tilt, it will actually correct them to, uh, to a degree, which is quite nice. Um, let me look at the other things. Um, Yeah, it, it's not a panacea. Some things just don't deconvolve very well. Uh, and a lot of it's the hardest parts to deconvolve is if you have a bright galaxy and you have a star in the middle of a bright galaxy. That's the hardest one. Um, uh, bu 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 yeah. Astro image is like a cooking show. Hang on. Here's one I prepared earlier. Yes, it is indeed. Um, one or less arc seconds per pixel. Uh, yes, uh, most of my images are between one and a half and 0 0.5 arc seconds per pixel. Because um, uh, the longest focal length I have is 2000 millimeters. Um, uh, duh, duh, duh. Okay. Uh, the rest, I think, was just a chat between yourselves. So I don't think there's any other questions unless I've missed anything. Um, the thing is, I, I noticed there's a bit of uh, discussion about whether you should use it and whether it works or not. Um, there's no harm in trying. So if it doesn't work, the, the, there's it's not prescriptive. The thing about astrophotography just like with it's it's um ansel adams had a famous quote he said the the negative is the score and the print is the performance and it's a wonderful quote and you know your your images that you take through your telescope they're the, they are the equivalent of the negative they are the score and how you how you choose to to conduct the the, the score is is your it puts your thing on it um and there isn't a set of rules that says you must do this and you must do that. Sometimes things work for unexpected reasons. Sometimes they, they don't work for unexpected reasons. Um, the biggest issue I have is with big bloaty stars like this, because um, I can fix these small ones, but these ones typically are, 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 are a pain. And I have been known to, uh, if it's on its own, when I've finished an image, I'll go into to, uh, Photoshop or equivalent and do um and, and and distort it down to a smaller size because even morphological transformation doesn't always work because it picks up if there's a single dark pixel in that area when you try and shrink it it will take that as the lowest value and it will suddenly give you a black circle around it so it's it's tricky so um, chris I, I'm, I'm curious on that score the 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 cheating stuff that, that you do in Photoshop. What? When, when I do that, I use the pinch function. Are you yeah, using yeah. something else? Well, yeah, because people said that digital imaging, people, well, I, I don't like, 
when digital photography, I don't like fully constructed images that then try to pass as I took this image and I got up early in the morning when in actual fact you didn't, you're in bed when this, you know. Uh, but digital uh, image manipulation has been around since 10 by eight glass plate cameras. Um, you know, um, montage has been around since, you know, the 19th century. So, you know, it, it's, in, it's interesting that they call it painting. Um, they, they, yeah, that this is what <laughs> PixInsight has a very low <laughs> esteem of, of clone stamp. They call it oh, yes. painting. You know, okay, it, you use it selectively when you have to. I'm not, I actually use it to take a star out of my images because then I know it's my image. Um, I, one of the people that reviewed uh, my book for the publisher, he was telling me that he had a bunch of his images copied and passed off as their own. So, um, yeah, you know, because he was, they, were, they just, he, he took them off his website and, and he used them on his own website and saying, well, these images are taken. So, um, yeah. Oh, that's that's brilliant. So you just you just find a star and secretly just, secretly remove it, and yeah. then you know which image is whether an image is yours or not. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just something, just a, an insurance policy, if ever there was one. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, what else have I got? Add stars. I, it looks like you guys actually are probably ahead of me. Let's look at star color. Okay. So this is uh, the image I think I used on one of my books, uh, the front cover. Um, and it was a total surprise. I almost didn't bother processing this image because the, the, the narrowband monochrome images looked absolutely awful. Anyway, um, that's what linear fit does for you. Suddenly boosts all the color, but the stars are an awful color. So what I've done is separately taken RGB stars and here they all are. So that's a natural, RGB uh, image, which has been color balanced. So a little bit stronger saturation than normal. There's a very faint outline of the, um, the cloud. Um, but this is, the, this is the trick. What you do is you match the luminances of these two images. So there's something called extract luminance, or you can use this button at the top left here, um, and you create a luminance file. Um, so I'm going to drag that. Oh, hang on. I need to drag onto a clone. I never can be sure if it replaces it or creates another file. Okay. I, thankfully, it didn't create a. Get rid of that one. So my mouse is my mouse is drunken because of the processing speed. <laughs> so I've got a luminance file. I'm now going to do. Um, apply this luminance to this file here using LRGB combine. So I'm just going to select this one here. Uh, get the right one. Oops. Come on. uh, which one is it? Uh, mix. Uh, there we go, down the bottom. Of course, it had to be down the bottom. And then drag it onto here. Okay, so what I now have is two images with exactly the same luminance information, but one's got star color and the other one hasn't. So what you can actually do now is you could just use a, a simple mask. So if I did that simple mask process that I was doing the other day, which is just remove the higher scales. So if I just create a duplicate Oh, maybe better do it on this one actually, and, and make a star mask out of it. Now it's going to go black because, um, or almost black because of the. So it needs to be blurred slightly. So I just put a bit of blurring on, and then a bit of stretching because it's going to be a mask that so needs to be a bit brighter. So there's my star mask. It's not perfect, but it'll do for as an illustration. Then I drag my mask onto my color image and get rid of that. And then the simplest 
of pixel maths that you could possibly ask for. Just the name of the star image called RGB star, and you drag it onto there. And my stars have just become different color. So if I just come back, it's not perfect, and you sometimes have to tune the mask a little bit. But if I go back and forth, so there's the magenta stars, and there's the slightly more natural color stars. If you notice that some of the surroundings, the stars have still got some weird coloration. So you sometimes just have to blur the mask a little bit. But you know, I've now got blue stars, I've got some orange stars and red stars. So that's that's a, a quick and dirty way of getting star color into an image. Um, but that's an image that's already got stars in it. Um, when I processed this image, I wasn't removing stars. Um, so anything, any questions on that? Chris, Alistair had a question back on, on your oh, decon, I mean, go... deconvolution. He wanted to know how many iterations you... Right. I typically start off with the default, which is about 10 or so. And as I said, those subsequent processes tend to sort of undo the deconvolution. And if it, if by the end of it, and I get to the, um, the, the, the regularization of the background, and I've basically lost all the benefits of doing the deconvolution in the first place, what I'll sometimes do is just increase the number of iterations by about 50%. Um, and it just puts a bit of bite back in. Uh, and that's really the only iteration I'll do. It, it's, uh, it, it's just a balancing thing. And, and also, just to emphasize this bit about eye and brain, you, it sometimes helps when you do some major manipulation on an image to go away and have a cup of coffee and come back and look at the image on screen because you'll suddenly go, oh my goodness, that's really coarse. Um, and you won't have seen it when you've done it um, initially. It's a bit like if you take all the color out of an image, um, it, you get a, a visual um, perception of the opposite color in your brain for about four or five seconds. And it's, it's all those sorts of eye brain things that will confuse you. So sometimes it's, it's good to take some time to, to look and appreciate what you're doing and also not go too far too quickly um, because it's difficult to undo things, but it's much easier to do them, um, to sort of increase them and, su and such. So um, let me just check the channel. Any other questions? Uh, uh, right, just scroll down. Yeah, the, the thing about going higher, um, I see your, your note, Alistair. Um, I think it, a lot of it depends on the image itself. Uh, there, there is a law of diminishing returns, I know, um, but I have tried excessive numbers and it sometimes goes completely mad. Um, so yes, by all means, try more um, and, 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 and as I say, I think a lot of it depends on the image itself. I think I used to, I think I used to do thirty or forty at some point in time, and then used to back off a little bit. But but I changed scopes and cameras and stuff, so maybe that's the reason why. Um, okay. So the other ad question is: I'm just going to check my original presentation to. Check the agenda. Two seconds, because I can't remember what the agenda was. Uh, right. Masking alternative star substitution. OK, so I think we're doing all right for time. Do you want me to, to wrap up here or just do the last of the, I think there's one last thing which was putting stars in. Yeah, that, that would be helpful if you want to talk about so, that. That's always okay. been a challenge for me. Right. So here's an image without stars, uh, which is the, um, oh, I was just about to say it's on the tip of my tongue, the jellyfish nebula, which is, <laughs> which looks like it's just shat itself. <laughs> anyway, and um, here's some nice stars. Well, how do I get those into there? Well, one way of doing it is uh, actually quite simple. The, if you take the stars themselves 
um, and go into multi-scale processing and medium processing. If I literally remove the background, so just drag onto there and just take out the background altogether, I might have done it already actually. So all I'm left with is the dots. Um, I can literally add that to there and it'll just simply add the stars in. So nebula plus stars, nice simple formula, create a new, create a new image, off we go. There's the star, whoops, why does it do that? There are the stars. That's, that's a, now you might have to tune it because I've got um, a big star with a cross on it and a few other things, but that's one way of doing it. Um, the danger is that if the stars are very close to being uh, one on this image, when you move them across to here, they'll, they'll clip because they add on to the background. So sometimes you have to be a little bit more, a uh, little bit more careful and you might say stars times 0 0.8 or something like that. Um, I think I'm thinking about it. It, is. Uh, it is times, yeah. So if I do it again, the stars aren't quite as bright, but they haven't clipped. The other thing you can do, which is quite interesting, um, if you think about the image values, the image values are between naught and one. If you square a value lower than one, it gets smaller. So if you want to actually reduce your star sizes, you can do this. So it actually basically takes the square of the value of the stars and adds it um, and if you notice, the stars have, have shrunk in size. So that that's quite a handy technique if you want to just shrink the stars down a little bit before adding them. Um, because it, it, if you look at the profile of a star, you know, think of the PSF function, and if you took the square of that value, it becomes more of a point uh, with less of a, of, a, of a skirt around it. So um, it does make the, some of the stars uh, that makes the dimmer stars dimmer. So at the same time as making them slightly smaller, it actually reduces the the sheer volume of stars. If you look at the sheer volume here, you've got loads and loads here, and it's become less here. So the nebula now becomes the main feature in the image, as opposed to um, being disguised by a whole bunch of stars on top. Um, so if you, if you compare that with that, it's a different emphasis that you might find is preferable. Was that useful? Yeah, that was very helpful, yeah. Um, there's lots of other tricks you can do with stars. I mean, you can use star masks. Um, to get a good star mask, it takes a lot of operations because you have to build a star mask up at different scales and at different um, intensities. Uh, I've never found a single star mask setting that just simply creates a star mask. Um, one way you um, can do some clever things if you want to is just using the image itself. So um, if you want to create a mask, you can just 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 drag it and stretch it uh, and and set your endpoints carefully, and you can you can create a, a, a quite a simple mask that way as well. Um, but it. it that sometimes the best way to do it is to just experiment with some ideas. But it's a bit like Photoshop. After a while, you, you start to recognize what works. So for instance, um, that's not being very helpful. So uh, for some reason, that's very, very, oh, because it's very, very black. It's right because I've taken the black tones off. Any stretching makes the background go gray. So perhaps not the best way of doing that. I should have. Uh, that's not going to work for me. Come on, mouse. Wakey, wakey. All right, get rid of this. And undo this. Yeah, I think I must have removed the um, that background already on this. Oh, there is a faint bit of nebulosity there. No, there is background. Hmm. 
Okay. The other thing I don't know if you if you've noticed, um, have you ever used History Explorer? Because the other thing about History Explorer is you can you can take an image that's done some fancy things to it, and if you say, well, actually, I need that for another image, you can just drag the processes that were applied to that image and drag them out, and then you can apply them to a different image. So it, it's a quite nice way of of creating a um, a rep repertoire of actions and settings as well that you know work and then you can apply it to a whole bunch of other things um, you know very similarly so there's lots of little tricks in pics and sites that are poorly documented and the more you use it the more you find out the thing I'm using now because I'm doing it for the new book is something called startles um which is taking a time so this is a completely different way of, of processing images um it doesn't do stacking or anything you have to use something else i'm using astap to do the stacking um but its idea is completely different um and it does a lot of things automatically and it iteratively so it will take an image and apply deconvolution and then several processes later it will go back automatically and optimize the deconvolution or whatever um, i haven't used it properly in anger yet but it's a very different approach to pics and sight and for some um, maybe the perfect uh, opportunity to do astro imaging where they don't want to learn a program like this which is quite frankly um, a bit elitist in the way it's presented sometimes um, you know it it's written by scientists and to, to please other scientists and uh, it's not it could be on site more user friendly so i'm going to stop the pics and site just there right now um, and see if there's any other questions my voice is beginning to give out now uh, joe was asking how you uh, were using that wavelet tool when you made the mask so I think you were using what multi-scale linear transform? Yes. So uh, multi because it's already a stretched image, it's the median transform. Increase the number of layers so that it's not picking up on the nebulosity. And all I did was um, I initially started off by just taking off what they call the residual, which is the background level. But it, I still could see some of the nebula. So I then took off um, scale seven and then scale six until I got the stars. Um, if I keep on going down, it will make the stars smaller and smaller, and even the bloated stars like this one over here will become smaller and smaller. Um, for those who don't know what I mean by scale, let me show you something. There's a, a, a script that will show you the different scales. Um, I don't remember where it is. I can never remember where these, some of these things are. I think it's under image analysis. There are. You're right. Here we go. So this is going to take this image and separate it into what it sees as the different scales. So this is the background, the residual, um, which is a very blurry image. Um, and then as you go finer and finer, you start to see where the detail is. So for instance, if you have a, a galaxy with a, a dust lane, you can actually decide um, which scale you need to sharpen to show the dust lane. Um, so at scale, this is scale um, two, and it's still quite showing distinct areas of nebulosity. And then this is scale of two pixels, which is just showing stars. Oh, there is a there is a faint. The nebulosity has got detail showing in scale two, which means it's quite well processed. And scale one, uh, it's just the tiniest stars. There's a I can just about make out the head of the the jellyfish, but that's about it. So you can choose what you you know. Typically, sharpening scale one doesn't really do much for an image other than increase noise. So for for instance, scratch this you can see that there's extreme stretch. It's, it's, it's stars, but it's quite a bit of noise as well. 
but you can still see the nebula there you can still see it which is quite good so i probably could do more to get better detail in the final image but Joe, you see, you see what Chris has done here when he applies multi-scale median transform, and he takes, he X's out those top layers and applies it to an image. What it does is it destroys the large-scale detail, so it just leaves him with the stars alone, the small-scale detail, which in this case is the stars. So it's a kind of a, a quick and easy way to, well, I don't know, easy, but, but yeah. it is a way to make a star mask. Or to or to be to be left well, with an image that is just the thing. The, the reason the reason that it, it can be useful. Uh, that actually, I tell you another trick to do star masks. One of the problems with star masks is it works on the basis that it the background is an even level. So when you bring up a star mask, it says, "What's the noise threshold?" Um, so what sometimes works better is if you can take the background off. And be left with stars this has a much easier task so for instance if i just literally take off everything but uh, the big structures off here but it'll also remove the background so it's black if you then apply a star mask to this it has a much better better job because you've taken out all the structures that caused some stars to be selected and some to be deselected even though the stars were the same brightness so um, running a star mask on this might be more beneficial uh, than trying to do it before you took out the background. It's probably a bad example. I probably should have done it to the nebula image, but there we go. But it's star masks are, are tricky, but the best, there is a tutorial, see that's awful. Yeah, absolutely awful. Um, so, I need to play around with these, change the scales for each of the different. So as you change the noise threshold, you change the scale and you change your, your growth and you can also change the, the smoothness. So small stars don't need as much smoothing. And then you build up several star masks and then you use PixMath Pix to add them all together um, and but not rescale them, just to add them together. Because um, if you rescale them, uh, you, you can, Get rid of all the tiny ones for instance so yeah it, star masks are a pain um and i try and avoid doing them if i can um okay anything else uh to say i think i'm getting to the point that it's a saturday afternoon saturday evening now saturday evening beer i think yeah. is, is in <laughs> order right. It's moved on further for you than it has for us. But uh, we uh, we we appreciate the time that you've taken to talk to us, Chris. Uh, if uh, anybody has uh, any last minute questions for for Chris, uh, uh, go ahead. But uh, uh, otherwise, we will uh, let you go off and have your Saturday evening evening <laughs> or pint. I'm sorry, it has to be called a pint, right? Yeah, we do. Uh, well, yeah, England's one of these strange companies, countries where it still doesn't really know whether it's metric or imperial still. <laughs> we still have miles, um, <laughs> but we have litres of milk, but uh, we have litres of, of fuel, but our gallons are different. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, working for Ford, you know, I got used to it. Uh, Chris, uh, Alan Goldberg had one last question in the chat. Uh, I can't see. Oh, right. Um, I'm still here, so I can ask it. Yeah, um, that's okay. I'm reading it. So yeah, the question when you, when is... When you did the deconvolution, um, the deconvolution depends on everything being linear across the star brightnesses. Yeah. But I thought you had done some nonlinear... That was, screen, that was a screen stretch, Alan. Yeah. That wasn't that was still linear data. I'd only done a screen stretch, which is just for you know viewing purposes. Okay. You hadn't you hadn't done a histogram adjust? No, no, not at all. The, the only thing I would have done would be the Muir D noise. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um so the thing the thing is is that when you get errors and you start distorting the errors, um 
if the error is use if the error is formed by a process that's that can be modeled um and you've distorted it then the the model doesn't work as well to, to take it back out again um so um people have deconvolved deconvoluted convolved you've deconvolved um nonlinear images but um yeah i mean if you want to sharpen up an image um has anyone come across uh topaz i've heard of it i've never used it though it, it's actually a photography um it's a photography let me just find it um I thought it was for noise to reduction, though, not for sharpen. Uh, well, there's, there's several. This is to Topaz Sharpen. Oh. It, it does a pretty good job on astro pictures, but but you you know you you've got time to turn the kettle on and wait for the tea to brew before it finishes doing an image. Um, so um, it is it is very slow, and it allegedly uses artificial intelligence. Um, hmm. So I use it and love it. <laughs> Yeah, I use both uh, the uh, noise reduction as well as the sharpening, and it works better on some images than it does on yeah. others. And also, they've come out with a flurry of recent updates, which has significantly improved the speed. Okay, yeah, I, th I think I'm not on the very latest updates. I'm, I think I've got one or two, Greg, um, but. Yeah, I use it selectively. But the other thing I'll sometimes do, and that's that's the other thing you have to think about when you're doing imaging, is who is the who is the audience? Is it is it a a, a monitor? Is it a print? Is it a book? Uh, because everything for the book has to be in CMYK, which is um, great fun when you're trying to do a comet, because um, it doesn't come out very well. Uh, but if it's for the monitor. Uh, you you you've got to set it to typically sRGB color profile because most monitors are assuming that uh, otherwise you lose your colors. Um, you also have to think about scaling as well. If it's for print, um, you have a different set of characteristics that you're you're thinking about. Um, so you you have to consider at what scale it will be viewed at um, because the thing about um, images when you project them um the the when you're doing prints and you're doing print resolution you know classical photography uh you the typical viewing distance of a print uh the minimum typical viewing distance is the same as the diagonal of the print so uh if you take that into account and the the actual angular resolution of our our vision you typically wouldn't need um if, if you've got perfect resolution at 10 by 8, which corresponds to our minimum focusing distance for a, a young adult, you, if it's good at 10, 8, you could take those same pixels or same negative and blow it up to 4 foot by 5 foot and view it from the appropriate distance and you won't notice a difference. Um, so sometimes these high pixel count cameras are actually counter productive uh, in so much that it's giving you more resolution than you need unless you're going to be cropping um uh, and it's there is a another there's another article which may be of some interest to folks people always concentrate on pixels and what the pixels doing but at the end of the day the pixels make up an image and I, I showed an example to some people at my club that said, look, here are two sensors with two different pixel sizes. And these, this is their read noise and their dynamic range. So which one's better? And one looked, the, the one with the smaller pixels had lower read noise, had, had um, higher dynamic range. Um, but I said, OK, now, now if, there are, um, if these fit into a physical image, um, what's, which is the best image? And it turned out to be the other one because you have to think about the image as a whole rather than as a set of pixels. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's called, I think it's part of information theory, if I, if I recall. I th again, I think the book, um, this book, Lessons from the Master, uh, I think it actually has some chapters on it. Um, and it's, it's, it's worth, considering it's, it's not the be all and end all but it's um 
it, it tries to i think what it's trying to do is it's it's trying to get people off this drug of pixels and only thinking about pixels and just thinking the bigger picture uh, my eight megapixel qsi camera had more enough to, you know had more resolution than my than my telescope and tracking could do All right. Well, I don't see any other questions, Chris. Um, uh, and but uh, we definitely appreciate the the presentation for you. Um, so in uh, whenever Google finishes uh, giving it to me, uh, the presentation will be uh, uh, put up online. And Chris, I'll send you a link to it, and I'll uh, post a link for uh, the uh, folks in the group so that uh, everybody can uh, can take a look at it. All right. So what, was that useful? Um, uh, that was very helpful. Yeah, to 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 get the details. You know, as I as I mentioned to you when we first got started, or when we when we had talked about this in advance, sometimes people do uh, like an end to end processing walkthrough, um, but it's also helpful to 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 do this in, instead. Uh, sometimes to to get uh, to to take a deeper dive into individual steps in the process, because a lot of the steps, you know, we we don't change them. They're they're the same for 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 every image. But uh, getting a, a deeper insight into some of the tools that we have to apply while we're processing an image is really helpful. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, is let the image tell you what it needs doing to it. Um, so it, the, you know, a narrowband image would be very different to uh, a cluster uh, and, and so forth. So um, the, it's like when digital imaging first started i used to judge photographic competitions uh, at camera clubs and people used to sharpen clouds it's yeah like when, you know the, the clouds had you know were razor sharp i could cut myself on them and it's like it just it, it because they they got a sharpening tool so they had to use it and and also they forgot the visual aspect of it that um something that's sharp and high contrast attracts the eye so if you've got a central object and you've got distracting details around the perimeter, it actually is a distraction and it lessens the impact of the image. And it's actually sometimes better not to sharpen that or even very slightly blur it um, without making it obvious to de-emphasize uh, the bits that you, which, are, which are supporting acts as opposed to the key role. Um, and that's why sometimes this business of reducing star sizes, especially with nebulas that are in the middle of the Milky Way, you know, that those those stars can overwhelm this delicate nebula and actually replacing them with a slightly um, a finer version can actually make the nebula appear more beautiful, make it more prominent. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, so uh, everybody, as we mentioned, uh, next time we get together, we're going to be talking about, well, hopefully next time we get together, we're going to be talking about backyard observatories. If not, uh, Randy and uh, John will uh, do their uh, processing walkthrough for us, and then we'll do that in, uh, in August. But we'll send out uh, an update for everyone. And uh, when uh, Google hands us the uh, uh, recording of uh, today's uh, 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 meeting, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll send out a link to that. And uh, Chris, I'll send one, to send one off to you, too. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, enjoy your pint. And thanks again well, for, for, for sitting in with us. Well, I'm glad you are actually taking images because there's only three images in my club. It's a it's a very good club and there's a lot of very good astronomers, but very few people do imaging. So it's really nice to talk to a bunch of guys that um, actually can pull apart what I'm doing. <laughs> well, you're you're definitely welcome to join us anytime you want. Uh, the uh, one of the fringe benefits of uh, being a presenter is you're a permanent friend of the group now. So uh, you're uh, invited to join us when uh, whenever we uh, get together. I can uh, send you a send you a link to our to our next meeting. I appreciate that. Thank you. Or, or put another one. You're stuck with us, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once well, you're here, you're always here. <laughs> I've, I've, I think I've only done about one image in a year uh, because of conditions and failures and camera equipment failures and all sorts. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got a very very meager palette at the moment. <laughs> Well, uh, you you I, you're always welcome to help us process our images. I, I'm sure that I've, I've done that for some people. To send their, yeah. their data to you. Yes, yeah, big Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, take care, gentlemen.
All right. Ladies, sorry. Ladies Great. and gentlemen. Thanks a lot. Great All right. presentation. Thanks, Chris. We appreciate your time. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.